Hello everyone, and welcome to the TTV Modcast, episode 14. Yeah! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Flowing through my body, uh. much like how energy flows through Korra's body, yes. in the legend of Korra. <laughs> but, We're but, talking about the legend of Korra today. Yes. I don't know if you realize. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course, with the title and all, but before we get to Korra, let's get to our names. So... I'm Wudge. Robo! Wow! I'm John Smith. And I'm Lego Master. Slime, <laughs> what did you do? I was just drinking some water. I don't know what, what was so weird about that. Sounds like you would become a fish. <laughs> no, Slime is the greatest water bender. He was just showing off his talents. You know who Since else is a water bender? <laughs> Cora, Cora is a waterbender. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so we did our Avatar episode two weeks ago. In that episode, we mentioned a bit about Cora, and so I guess we can just continue our discussion about it. This is Avatar: The Legend of Cora for those that don't know, and we'll probably spoil things. Everything. So you have been warned, but we all recommend it. So go watch it <laughs> before, and then yeah. come back watch this. I'm sure this probably isn't a controversial opinion, but it's not as good as Avatar The Last Damn Render uh, Whoa, in a lot of ways. such an edgy opinion. I'm so controversial. Hashtag can't break these chains. Use that on bird chatter. But there's a lot of things about it. Pacing is weird and plot points are men. All sorts of stuff like that. And altogether, the fact where it's less cohesive for various reasons. Altogether, it's just not on the same level. As Avatar The Last Airbender. That's kind of the way I see it as well. Like, it's not at the same level of quality as with Avatar. Or Avatar The Last Airbender, that is. And I think it mostly, I'll probably talk about this later, but like, stems from the development issues that the creators had. Because Nickelodeon, when the guys were pitching the idea, they were like, they were given one season. <laughs> And then as it went on, they were given three more seasons. Mm -hmm. So, like, I guess the biggest difference between Korra and The Last Airbender for me would be that The Last Airbender felt like a story that had a beginning, middle, and end and was already thought out from the beginning. Like, when they were making season one, they mm. had an idea of how it was going to end. But with Korra, because of the development issues, or rather just Nickelodeon screwing them over, was the fact that, like, they ended season one like they were going to end, like, that would be a definite end, because they weren't sure if it was actually the definite end. So when it actually got a season two they were still trying to come up with new ideas because they hadn't thought that far so uh. it feels less like they actually had a solid idea of how they were going to structure everything but as well they had seasons three and four for that where they actually came up with a more cohesive story like that's when it actually for me got on similar levels as avatar in some cases i'd say some episodes are even better than a lot of the episodes in Avatar Less Air Better for season yeah. three and yeah. four. I mean, that's just why I think that uh, Korra mm -hmm. in general. I'm of the same opinion, because for me, Korra, both in terms of some of the characters and some of the relationships, this gets criticized a lot, but I think that it's it's really a case of the series turned out to just be a little inconsistent in general. I think the first season was all right. Not as good as Last Air Bender, but still pretty decent. Season two, as we've said, was kind of not the greatest thing ever. It had its moments, but overall, it wasn't particularly remarkable, except for the one episode. And then it got a lot better in season three and four. Still not as good as seasons two and three of Last Airbender, but definitely a worthy successor, I would say, overall. I liked Korra for many reasons, one of which was the fact that it wasn't exactly the same as Avatar, and it didn't try to be exactly the same as Avatar, in the sense that the setting of Republic City is so much different than anything you get in The Last Airbender. It does seem a little fast as far as technology goes, but it does give the sense that we aren't living in the time of The Last Airbender now. This is now. 
this is new. For me, that was actually one of my <clears throat> biggest turnoffs for season one of Korra, because for ATLA, the thing that I loved the most about it was the fantasy setting. I even like created my own fan fiction universe. I kind of created my own fan fiction storyline taking place after The Last Airbender that focused a lot more on kind of the rural aspect of it, really for exemplified by Zuko alone. The Zuko alone avatar of The Last Airbender had that kind of like, the creators described it as almost a Western-ish style. And it was like a Western medieval type of thing. I I really, really liked that overall style. And personally, I wish we could have seen more of kind of the Hundred Year War from the original series. I understand why we didn't. It's a Nick show, for goodness sakes. But for me, I really liked that. And then the modern setting of Korra especially considering the the relative advancement of the world in Avatar and the world in Korra 70 years later, it felt a little bit like a jump to me. And to me, it just felt less original. I got used to it gradually, and I think that they did a better job of of kind of combining bending with like traditional bending, not some of the rule-breaking stuff I feel like they did in season one, but traditional bending with kind of more modern stuff in the later seasons. But for season one, it just felt a little bit too abrupt to me. It was interesting to see an actual city in the Avatar universe, though I found the setting to be kind of dull. Like, maybe it's just the fact that there wasn't that much color to it, I suppose. Mm, there wasn't yeah, you're right. That vibrant of a setting. It was mostly, like, gray buildings. I mean, there was some, there were some interesting scenes in Korra, though. Her fight with Tarlock, there's basically, like, this water fountain that they mm-hmm. use to fight, and that's, like, that's a really cool scene, but for a lot of it, yeah. I felt like it just kind of felt dull. Like, even the pro-bending Oh, don't get me started on pro-bending. Yeah. It kind of goes against my very natural kind of view of the Avatar world. We talked about it in the last Airbender modcast, but, you know, the the idea that it's really based around martial arts combined with kind of the environment. And I feel like in pro-bending, it loses a lot of that. It becomes so constricted and so fake to me that I I could not get into it. And I really enjoyed when they kind of got back. I mean... It was a good way to introduce the characters, but in season two, three, and four, I really liked that they got back to the more conventional bending. So for pro bending, though, it would have been interesting, now that you bring it up, since for season two, episode six of Avatar, which was the episode where Toph was introduced, yeah, she was part of that whole, like, underground wrestling... Earth Rumble Earth, 6. Uh, yeah, Earth Rumble 6. <laughs> and so it would have been really interesting, though, if pro bending... Although, I guess, I don't know, I suppose pro bending is more like, there's more solid rules for, <laughs> for, yeah, exactly. for that, and I guess that's sort of just less interesting because like with earth rumble six anything could happen the stakes yeah, are higher I mean, to yeah. me pro bending felt like not necessarily a natural progression but a logical progression i think would be the best way to put it now that people are living in the city they're gonna have more free time and they're gonna want to devote it to entertainment and what's more entertaining than watching people bend it felt logical that the sport would develop around that that that's okay. basically my thoughts on that as well and that's like, also like the whole urban aspect of Korra because like you see i think one of the first scenes of oh gosh i've forgotten his name male fire protagonist mako <laughs> mako <laughs> thank you it's been a while since i watched it okay yeah. Uh, yeah mako like one of the first scenes with him is how he's like working in a shop where he's like bending electricity i can see how for some people that's like you're taking away the sacred nature of lightning yeah. bending and making it not special but for me that seems like a completely natural progression because as you look at the history of the world the world that's how things that seemed mystical in the past get explained more and more as science evolves and so like the fact that things become more and more industrialized makes sense to me. And I actually yeah, yeah. kind of, as, as someone who likes a lot of industrial era history, it really appeals to me. Something I want to throw in is that I get the desire to have like a more naturalistic setting kind of uh, along the lines of <laughs> Lord of the Rings where, you know, the natural world is a big focus. A lot of the feel of the story comes from the setting. But at the same time, I'm really tired of the medieval stasis trope where stasis? every fantasy world stays as a medieval society for thousands of years. So I actually oh. really liked that they showed the Avatar universe 
progressing technologically. I never thought of that before. (laughs) I know this is going to sound really stupid, but like it never occurred to me that fantasy worlds can actually evolve. Even Mm -hmm. sci-fi. Well, sci-fi sometimes does it. Like Star Trek did it. In the Star Trek universe, science evolved. And I feel like in Star Wars, they've started to do that with the new canon. They've started to define the fact that that, that there is a progression of technology in that universe. But getting back to Avatar, you're totally right. that it, It does do a very natural thing that not very many other series do. How about the villains of Legend of Korra? Ooh, ooh, okay. I, mean... I think <laughs> with the exception of season two, what's his name again? Unalak and Vatu. <laughs> like, Unalak and Vatu are kind of like the combo villain. Yeah. Combo. Now, other than that, I'd say the villains of Korra are very good and a lot more dynamic than Ozai was. Yeah. And a lot more... I don't know Understandable. if I... Understandable? politically charged but definitely relatable yeah like you see their intentions they're not they're not over the top megalomaniacs ozai i feel had his place in uh in the last airbender as the kind of the big megalomaniac villain like people sometimes accuse ozai of being two-dimensional i think he works especially in context of all the other villains of like especially zuko and azula and the absolute like the heart-wrenchingly terrible relationship that that family had i think that ozai's whole thing worked but here's an interesting idea that i just had i feel like Ozai's villain would not work in Korra because he's anachronistic. He's outdated. Yeah, and that's another thing that I liked about Korra was the fact that along it, it's it's an it's an evolution of the world in general. It's not just the setting, it's also the characters themselves where the villains are no longer just I'm evil, I want to take over the world because I want power, which for Ozai, like you said, it works. He is two-dimensional, but it's not out of place. Whereas I could see what you're saying if he was in Korra, it would just feel bland. I yeah. think that's kind of the reason why I didn't like Unalak as much, because he kind of had that a little bit. I just think he wasn't very well developed as a, as a character, period. Like, season two was kind season of... Season two was, like... was, a, was, a, was, a, was a... Can we all agree that it was kind of a mess? Yeah, I, I don't even really recall a whole lot that happened in season two, because, like, the only thing that's really stand out about season two are the one episodes just the story in general of one going and acquiring all of the elements is pretty cool to build on what John said, now that you bring up Juan, I realize that it really used the whole idea of like technological progression in the Avatar world. Because you see that the societies in Juan's day are very primitive. But you can see the roots of the four nations. And you can see immediately that there is differences between those nations. Maybe it's partly the art style, but which is like a really gorgeous art style that they used. But also just I feel like the technology is not nearly there's like almost nothing. It's it's almost Stone Age. They played with that idea of technology more than I would have originally thought in Korra. What about the other villains? I mean, there's the obvious Zaheer is probably one of the best villains as far as like motivations. Yeah, I will say the whole he is the one who gets airbending. It's a little convenient for me. Yeah, he's a non-bender that gets airbending somehow. So why is he even locked up in the first place if he's just a non-bender? Either he's like incredibly like dangerous. So so like he. I guess has martial arts that allow him to like kill people with his bare hands, but I don't know. Like you're you're right about that slime. It just happened that he's obsessed with like their really like after that fact. If you just accept the fact that he's an airbender, you're like okay, well he he's a pretty good fit. But like origin story wise, it's like I don't know. That's just something that literally just occurred to me now. Yeah, for me, one villain that I feel isn't really brought up nearly as much anymore, probably because of the way he went out, is Amon. I love Amon as a the- as a thematic villain. Like he has the best stage presence. I'm thinking of that one scene in Korra. I don't know if you guys remember where Korra calls him out. She calls Amon out and then to like fight at Avatar Ang Memorial Island, and then Amon just completely psychs her out, and then winds up completely playing into her deepest fears and leaves her an emotional wreck. I just find that thematically, and also because of the real world comparisons in terms of re- uh, like revolutions, I think that he's he's got a lot going for him. His cause. What about his cause? What do you guys think? He's fighting for the non-benders because they're being He's oppressed and stuff, right? And I think he kind of has a point, though he obviously takes it too far. Kahi has outlined this a lot in in like the various TTV episodes where they've talked about Avatar, but K- Kavira is order, right? 
Basically, yeah. the way it was played out in season four was Kuvir was set up to be a person who's, yes, using force to take over these places, but for the greater good, essentially. Mm-hmm. And that's the whole basis of her character. And that kind of gets dropped in the finale and just becomes, you know, flat out evil. And then you're like, wait, what? I don't remember the exact point, but there was something where she either threatened to kill somebody or did kill somebody. It was it was in like episode four or five, I want to say. There was the point where she like she blackmails that one Earth Kingdom, um, the 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 Earth Kingdom elder who doesn't who doesn't want to go along with her plan. She basically implies that she's gonna if they don't join her, she's gonna squash them. That well, might I mean, have been it. I, I was thinking of something more insidious than that, though, but it's... I've, I only saw it once. Kavira's husband. What's his name? Kavira's husband. Oh. That's okay. it. <laughs> well, the moment when Kavira basically decides to blow him up with the rest of Team Avatar, and he, like, he kind of repents in that moment, I think I think it was Kai who said that it would have been a better character moment if he went along with Kavira, if he was, like, willing to die for the cause. I suppose. Uh, during the finale, she, she just, like, holds this massive cannon aimed at Korra... And I'm just like, what? What is this scene? It's like, I thought she's supposed to be more tactical. I guess she just got really angry and just wasn't thinking mm-hmm. straight at that point. And so it's like she just went on with her rage. But I just thought that was an interesting... Yeah. Uh, well, maybe she's a case of, like, good intentions that get corrupted by power. Like, you know, you know the saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I feel like that's kind of what happened with Kavira is that she started out with honorable intentions and she probably she thought she was doing the right thing but ultimately she was blinded by the the prospect of being like you know the earth empire empress and the prospect of she was she was so bent on restoring order that she ultimately lost the bigger picture she lost compassion in the name of justice and i think that's why she was an interesting villain so i i liked kuvira overall as a villain however I think it might have been interesting if she hadn't become completely evil because of the absolute power corrupts absolutely thing. I think she should have become slightly more corrupt as things went on. But I think it might have been more interesting, maybe. This is just a pet theory. I'm not saying this is definitely the case. It might have been more interesting if she hadn't become completely evil and Korra and company had still opposed her just on the grounds that dictatorship even if it's beneficial is never okay yeah Mm. i I totally agree with that what did you guys think of the romances i don't think they ever did romance well except for uh, varic and his assistant the first part of season one it's i don't think it's completely irrealistic i just think that it doesn't it's not the kind of thing that needs to be in like a tv show like that I get that they were probably trying to make it more realistic or more... Um, For older audiences, that it's more attractive to teenagers. Yeah. Cough, cough, but the, edgy, the way, cough, cough. But the way, the way they went about it, it just felt kind of cliché. Yeah, it, it didn't really feel like it was necessary. Any Anything to do with Mako, <laughs> basically. Do you guys think that Mako was the jerk? Because uh, I remember people online started to really harping on Mako, like they were like, r- like just absolutely tearing into him at some points. Do you think Mako deserves to, you know, portrayed as that like womanizer who played both Korra and Asami at different points? Uh no, <laughs> no, no. I I guess I could maybe see how it could be interpreted that way, but I definitely didn't see it as exploitive or I anything could... like. That. I could see the characters like Korra and Asami thinking of him that way, but I don't think that's actually what he's like, mm, or yeah. at least not what he intends. Yeah, like, I, and that 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 position, like, the Avatar fandom can be pretty rabid sometimes. <laughs> they, they kind of played on this a little bit in the series. Mako is the person who wants to please everyone and winds up please and winds up like hurting people that he loves. He tries to please everyone and he fails basically. And I believe they did they touch on that in like the clip show where Mako to you know all of his relatives like the the one cousin and the grandmother. Yeah, I, I just I, I think they touched upon that in, in that episode a little bit. The whole like both Mako kind of came off as a bit of a womanizer, but he really just tried to please everyone. I, I was just going to say you said clip show and I'd f- completely forgotten about it. They just had a straight up slideshow of previous yeah. episodes. Do you guys know the story why? Wrap up. Yeah, yeah. It's basically more of Nickelodeon screwing them over. 
wasn't it like budget issues because yeah, like Nick, they Nickelodeon slashed their budget a full episode was worth of budget at the last minute when yeah. they were in production. They made a Tumblr post about it. They had two options. Either they decrease the quality of the rest of the show, like across the board, they basically put less time into each episode and make the whole finished product look a little bit rougher or they do a clip show. Okay, that yeah. makes a lot more sense because I would have definitely preferred something more along the lines of the play from mm, yeah, from uh, Matt Lemon. Yeah, yeah, just a more unique. But but, but yeah, as far as budgetary concerns, I can totally understand. But they did kind of do that. Varric's Mover is, I would say, the spiritual successor to the play, to the Ember Island players. I, I feel like the fan service kind of makes it up to me. All of the in-jokes that they do, like saying that Unawak was a iffy villain. Do you guys remember the conference call? Oh, yeah, I remember that now. Can, can I just make one last point? Okay. My Cabbage's guy. Best character. <laughs> 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 I get this. Uh, and, yeah, and so with that... That, cabbages. Yeah, that was cabbages. that was the podcast. So goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.